everyone, and welcome back to the Church of Eastern Oaks Small Group Bible Study. Uh, again, we are doing 1 Peter, and we are nearing the end of 1 Peter. This is uh, chapter, uh, excuse me, lesson 12, and we're starting the last chapter of 1 Peter. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 in this lesson. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those, uh, open them up to 1 Peter chapter 5. And as you do that, as you turn to 1 Peter, let me ask you a question. How many of you have held some type of leadership position in your life? Maybe, maybe it's at church, maybe it's at work, maybe it's with a volunteer organization. You know, have you ever been in a leadership position? And if so, what would you think? Did you enjoy it? Uh, was it stressful? Was it rewarding? Most people in their life have been in some type of leadership position, but even if you've never been in a leadership position, everyone has been uh, part of an organization uh, where you worked with someone in leadership. Again, whether it be your job, volunteer organization, or the church. But every organization has some type of leadership structure. And inside these organizations, there are always going to be good leaders and bad leaders, right? There are going to be leaders, uh, people that you want to be leaders, and there are going to be people that you don't want to be leaders, right? Well, today, as we come to the final chapter of 1 Peter, Peter closes out his letter um, by first addressing the church leadership and then finally addressing the church as a whole. And so in this lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to start by just looking at Peter's instructions to the church leadership. And then next time in our final lesson, we'll look at uh, Peter's closing remarks to the church as a whole. So again, we've talked about a lot of different things throughout 1 Peter. And as he closes his letter, he does so by addressing the church as a whole, first the leadership, and then just the church membership. So let's start with 1 Peter chapter 5, and let's just read verse 1 together to begin with. Peter says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So let's pause right there for just a minute. So Paul addresses this last part of this letter to the elders among you. Well, the first thing we need to do is identify who is Peter speaking to. So who or what are the elders? Are these merely older members of the congregation? So are these just merely the elderly? Or is this a title of some kind? Well, the Greek word that we translate elders is the Greek word presbyteros. And it refers to a church leadership position in this context. According to New Testament theologian Thomas Schreiner, the word elders is often used in the New Testament to refer to those who had leadership positions in the church. Uh, specifically, this is what we would today call pastors. Okay, So in, in typical churches that, that you've probably been a part of, there is a pastor. Well, that's what Peter is talking about here. He's talking to the pastors, to the elders. Uh, David Wheaton writes, their task was primarily a pastoral one. In the early days of the church, they were called elders, indicating their status, and also uh, episcopoi, which means bishop or overseer, uh, to describe their function. So in the New Testament, uh, the title elder is synonymous with the title overseer. So you're going to see that throughout the New Testament. You'll see both of those terms used, and they both refer to the same position, the same role, and that is the role of the pastor. Okay? Uh, Peter typically uses the word elder, presbyteros. Uh, Paul typically uses the word overseer, but he also uses the word elder on some occasions. And in fact, in uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, uh, Paul uses these two ter terms interchangeably. Elder, overseer, they mean the same thing. Uh, likewise, Luke does the same thing in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 28. Those two terms, elder, overseer, uh, they're used as synonyms, okay? They both mean the same thing. The titles refer to the same position, and again, it's the position that we today call pastors, okay? Uh, according to Scripture, there are two offices or positions in the church. So there are elders or overseers, and that's what we call pastors today, and there are deacons. So there are elders or pastors, and there are deacons. The primary difference is that the position of an elder or an overseer uh, is a preaching and teaching position. This is why it's typically your pastor, or it should be your pastor, that is doing the preaching and the majority of the teaching in your church, because that is the position he has been called to, it is a teaching and preaching position. Uh, it is also the primary leadership role in the church. 
The other position of the church is a deacon. The, the role of a deacon is a serving position. Okay. Uh, furthermore, the role of pastor or elder overseer, that leadership role, that preaching teaching role, is reserved for men only. The scripture is very clear on that. So if you're watching this today and you're going to a church with a female pastor, and I, I know this is politically incorrect, but unfortunately it is biblical. If, if, if well, I say unfortunately, if it bothers you. Um, but the Bible is very clear. The role of a pastor is to be that of a male, not a female. Okay, uh, So again, a church that has a female pastor is violating scripture. Um, deacons, on the other hand, biblically speaking, can be both men and women, as both men and women can serve in many different areas and ways in the church. So, Paul addresses this letter, this end of the letter here, this last part, to the elders. And he also identifies himself as an elder. Okay, So Peter says, from one elder pastor to other elders and pastors. Speaking of elders, plural, notice that Peter uses the term elders. Um, the, the word is plural in the Greek. Is there any significance there to that being plural? Well, in the specific context here of 1 Peter, Peter is not addressing any one single congregation. This is a letter that would have went to multiple churches. So it's not really clear if there's any significance uh, in this particular instance in his use of the plural. However, from other New Testament passages, we know that New Testament churches typically exhibited a plurality of leadership. We see that in uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5, as well as James chapter 5, verse 14. What we see in the New Testament is that each church would have multiple elders or multiple pastors uh, who led the church, who did the preaching, who did the teaching, and then they would also have multiple deacons who would serve in various ways and roles throughout the congregation. So, for instance, here at the Church at Eastern Oaks, we currently have two elders, uh, myself and Pastor Eddie, our elders, our pastors. And then we have a, a church council, which functions as our deacon body. They are the deacons of our church. Uh, so that's kind of how that, that plays out here locally. Peter concludes this verse by mentioning that he personally witnessed the sufferings of Christ. Now, why does that matter? Why is, it, why is that significant? Well, Peter's intention here is really to add authority to his words. So he's saying, not only am I a fellow elder, but I'm an eyewitness to Jesus Christ. I'm an eyewitness to the life and the work of Jesus. As you know, suffering has been a major, major theme throughout the book of 1 Peter. And so Peter says, look, I witnessed his suffering. I witnessed his life. You can trust me, okay? Uh, Peter, again wants to add authority to, to this letter by doing so. And then finally, he asserts that he not only witnessed the sufferings of Christ, but that he will also experience the glory that is to come. Okay, And again, we've talked about this for the past several weeks. Jesus uh, accomplished his victory through suffering. Right? All suffering should be seen in this light. Yes, we are going to suffer, but it will lead to victory. Okay, It will lead to our glorification. Just as Jesus Christ suffered in this life but was glorified, we too will suffer in this life but will be glorified. All right? um, we, we've looked at this verse already, but I want to mention it again. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Peter says, excuse me, Paul. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So Paul says, Look, I can't even compare how great heaven is going to be when you look at the. Look at, when you look at the sufferings of this life, you can't even compare the two because heaven is going to be so much greater. Um, real quick, side note, I know we're almost at the end of this study, but right there I called Paul Peter by accident, and I've probably done that multiple times throughout this study because Peter and Paul sound a lot alike, and I'm talking a lot about Peter and a lot about Paul. So if I ever say Peter and I mean Paul, or I say Paul and I... And I anyway, if I get it backwards, just know what I mean. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> um, and then I snorted right there. That was funny. <laughs> Okay, knowing who Paul is addressing in this letter, he's talking to elders in the church, uh, let's now look and see, okay, well, what does he have to say to these elders, okay? Specifically, we can highlight three exhortations or commands that Peter gives to elders in the church. Uh, let's pick back up in verse 2. First uh, Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 2. Peter says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, 
not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So we find two exhortations right here in verse 2. First, elders are called to shepherd and oversee God's flock, doing so because it is God's will, not because they feel compelled to serve. Okay, Uh, Thomas Schreiner words this for us very, very succinctly by saying that. To shepherd and oversee God's flock, doing so not because it's God's will, excuse me, doing so because it is God's will, not because they feel compelled to serve. Let's think about that for a minute. What does it mean to shepherd God's flock? Well, primarily this is a reference to spiritual leadership. Okay, Elders are called to lead the church into a mature and obedient relationship with Christ. That is the goal or the role of an elder or a pastor. My job as a pastor is to lead my church into a mature and obedient relationship with the Lord. Uh, right into Colossians, the church at Colossae, Paul describes his calling as a pastor in this way. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul says, Him, speaking of Jesus, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That was Paul's goal. He wanted to present everyone to the Lord as mature in Christ. That's my goal as a pastor. That's what I want to do. I want to present my congregation as mature uh, followers of Jesus Christ. And the primary way we do that as a, as a pastor or an elder is through our preaching and teaching. That's how we bring about spiritual maturity in the church, or the primary way we bring about spiritual maturity. Uh, Shepherding will also include one-on-one discipleship, counseling, correcting the sheep uh, when they're wrong, leading the church through uh, instances of church discipline when necessary. All of that is the role or the job of the pastor, and the pastor does that. Why? To present the church mature in Christ. That's our goal, okay? What's the significance there to Peter referring to the church as God's flock? Why is that that important? Well, this serves as a great reminder to the elder, to the pastor of any local church, that this church does not belong to the pastor. Okay, this church is not my church. It's God's church. Okay, the people are not my flock. They belong to God's flock. All right? Um, So that's just a, a reminder for all pastors The church you serve is not your church in the sense that it belongs to you. It's God's church. It belongs to God. We are his under-shepherd, right? Um, While the elder does serve in a a position of of leadership, he does so under the leadership of Christ. And so the elder is, again, merely an under-shepherd of Christ, who is the shepherd, who is in charge of the church, right? The second exhortation we find there in verse 2 is, again, um, Thomas Schreider words it this way, Elders are to be eager in fulfilling their task and should not serve for financial gain. Elders or pastors should be eager to fulfill their task and should not serve for financial gain. Now, why why is that necessary? The practice of financially compensating the preaching elder, so paying your senior pastor um, for serving, began early in the life of the church. Okay, this has been going on for 2,000 years. In fact, it's actually commanded in Scripture. It's commanded in Scripture for churches to pay their pastors. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 and 14, Paul says, Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay? Paul says that the Lord commands that those who get there or that those who proclaim the gospel should make a living proclaiming the gospel. And so paying pastors is commanded in Scripture. However, due to the fact that we live in a sinful world, this could obviously be abused. Right? There are pastors out there who are just in it for the money, right? Who just want to make a paycheck. They want they, they serve only for selfish gain. And so for this reason, both Peter and Paul address the need for elders to not be lovers of money. Now we see that again in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Pastors are not to serve for financial gain. That's not why you become a pastor. You become a pastor to help the church mature and grow in their faith, okay, and proclaim the gospel, not to, uh, to just make money. Elders should serve out of a sense of calling, um, out of a desire to fulfill the task of an elder, they should care for those 
uh, who are their members or the members of the congregation, and they should serve them willingly and eagerly. All right? And just as that was necessary uh, to say 2,000 years ago, it's necessary to say today. There are pastors out there who are just in it for the money. That's not why we do this. Okay? The third exhortation is found in verse 3. Uh, again, according to Schreiner, he writes, Elders are to live as examples of the flock instead of using their authority to domineer the church. Now, why is this necessary? Just as there are some people who will try to exploit the church for financial gain, there are also those who want the position of elder simply because they want control. Right? We all know people who just want to be in charge. And so there are going to be people who just want to be in charge, and so they want to be an elder because they want to say they're in charge. We've got to remember that just because we're Christians doesn't make us perfect. Furthermore, not even those in the position of elder or pastor are beyond temptation. Okay, no one's perfect, and so uh, there are no perfect churches and there are no perfect pastors. So Peter gives these exhortations, and, and these exhortations are necessary to keep those in church leadership honest so that we see exactly what's expected of us, but also to help the church know what to look for and what not to look for in a pastor. Okay, you don't want a pastor who's only in it for the money. You don't want a pastor who just wants to pastor so he can tell people what to do. All right, that's not what you're looking for in a pastor. And Peter's very clear about that. Again, while no one is perfect, Peter goes on to say elders are meant to serve as examples to the flock. Okay, this is why elders are held to such high standards. Because while we're not perfect, we are meant to be or are told to be examples. Um, Paul, writing to Timothy, actually lists the requirements of an elder or an overseer. And here's what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7. through 7. He says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So that's the requirements for being an elder. That's a high standard. And again, while no one is perfect, that is what an elder should strive to be. Now, with the exception of able to teach, technically all Christians should exemplify those characteristics. Okay? Everyone should be able to, to that should describe every Christian, hopefully. Um, but again, the elder, the overseer, is to be the example. Those things should be true of them so that they can exemplify those things for the church. All right? Following these three exhortations, Paul now offers encouragement to elders. He does this in verse 4. He mentions the chief shepherd there. Who's the chief shepherd? Well, this is, of course, a reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the chief shepherd, and pastors are merely the under-shepherds. Right? Uh, when Jesus returns at his second coming, those who have served as elders, Peter says, will receive the unfading crown of glory. That is the, the reward of being an elder. Now, there's a lot of debate surrounding this because... Um, there is debate surrounding whether this is a special reward for elders or if Peter is merely referring to the eternal reward which all believers are going to get. Looking at how crown is used throughout other New Testament passages, it seems that this is a general reference to eternal life in heaven. So Peter's not really saying elders are going to get a special prize or a special reward. He's just saying that they are going to enjoy heaven. And that's the greatest reward. You see, that's what's so amazing is that all God's people will receive the same amazing reward. Okay, Pastors, church members, because we're all called to serve. We're all called to the same high standard. I'm not supposed to be better because I'm a pastor. In other words, you don't get to say, well, I'm not a pastor, so I don't have to be a very good Christian. No, we're all called to the same high standard. Likewise, we're all going to receive the same reward. All right? Eternity in heaven is the greatest reward, and we're all going to receive it. Again, pastors are, are supposed to be the example, but they are supposed to be the example so they can teach Christians how to live in the same way. Again, we're all called to the same high standard. 
Let's keep reading. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Peter goes on to say, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Close your, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, having addressed the elders in the first four verses, Peter now begins to address the rest of the church. We will look at, at most of the address next time in, in, in the last lesson. However, in verse 5, Peter specifically addresses the church regarding their response to the elders. So we're going to look at all this together. But the first thing we need to do is identify who is Peter referring to with the term younger. Okay, uh, Does he just mean those who are younger in age, or does he mean something else? And again, there's, there's some debate here. Not everybody's on the same page. Uh, some scholars believe that Peter is specifically addressing those who are young in age because younger people tend to be more rebellious, and so they need the encouragement to listen to the elders. However, others believe that Peter is using the term elder in contra- excuse me, the term younger in contrast to the term elder. Therefore, his remarks are not limited to those who are young in age. Peter is merely using the term younger to refer to anyone who's not an elder. Okay, so elders are your, your pastors, your leaders, and, and when he says to those who are younger, he's just talking about everybody else. Um, R.A. Campbell writes that the term younger is addressing those who are not elders, that is to say, all other church members. I believe that this latter exp- uh, explanation makes the most sense in the context. In verses 1 through 4, Peter is addressing church leadership who, by the way, were typically older in age. Okay, Typically your elders, pastors, overseers were not young because one of the requirements is they can't be new in the faith. right? And so usually it was people who were older in age. But in verses 1 through 4, he's specifically addressing the position of elder. Therefore, when he addresses those who are younger, or specifically, um, uh, what does he say there? I'm sorry. (laughs) Uh, Verse 5, he says, Likewise, you who are younger, I think there he's speaking to just the church at large. Um, Anyway, Peter's exhortation to the church is to humbly submit to the leadership of the elders. This submission, like the submission we read about earlier in 1 Peter, is not blind obedience, okay? If the elders do not faithfully follow Christ, then the church should not submit to their leadership. We said the same thing when we talked about citizens submitting to the government, slaves submitting to masters, wives submitting to husbands, Okay, those who are in a position of submission are called to submit as long as doing so doesn't violate God's word. And the same is true for the church. The church is commanded to submit to the leadership of the pastor. However, that's not absolute. If the pastor goes off book, you know, off the good book, then the church should not follow him. All right. However, if the pastor is leading the church biblically and faithfully, then the congregation is commanded to submit to the leadership of the pastor. All right? Uh, That's about all the time we got for this lesson, talking about elders and and, and church leadership. We'll pick up next time in our final lesson with Peter's address to the church at large and how he closes out this letter. But first, let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the letter of 1 Peter, for all that we've learned thus far. Lord, I pray for our pastors, our elders, our church leadership, Lord, in all of our churches. I pray that you give them wisdom. I pray that you give them strength to obey, uh, to, to serve you, to serve the church, to do so for the right reasons. Lord, I pray for our church members. I pray that uh, they will support and encourage their pastors, pray for their pastors each and every day. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time for our final lesson.